sets in motion a series of choices. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you all again today. I have a question for you as we start. How many of you have had a moment with somebody in your life that you would say is tense, kind of on edge, kind of one of those argumentative moments? How many of you have had one of those moments? Everyone has had one of those moments, have we? I've had one of those moments. It's impossible to be in, you know, pretty much any form of, um, whether it's you no know, marriage, you know, friendship, no relationship, without sometimes things getting tense. One place where I've experienced tension at times is in my marriage with my wife. We, we argue, we fight about things at times, but that's normal, right? You're going to clash, you're going to have conflict. That's, that's normal. In fact, very early on in our marriage, like two weeks in kind of early, we had one of these tense moments. And of course, when you're, you know, kind of newlyweds, things are pretty nerve-wracking to begin with. So you're kind of on edge already a lot of the time. We just finished leaving from Canmore. We were on our honeymoon. It was a wonderful time. And we decided we were going to take a pit stop up here in Edmonton to see my parents. We spent a few days here, and then we were going to go up to Fort St. John to see uh, probably Christie's parents up there. Um, I'd never been that far north before, though, driving. Like, I didn't know where I was going. And this is now, like, 15 years ago, and so we didn't have, you know, like these, I mean, those smartphones to help us out. We didn't have a GPS. We bought a map. That's how we were going to make our way up to Fort St. John. And my wife is in charge of the map while I drive. Some of you see where this is going immediately. As we're leaving Edmonton, we hit the highway, and I'm sure that the turnoff now for Highway 37 is, like, really close. Right? Like, I am convinced it's really close. And I even say to Christy, like, man, Man, like, did, did we pass it back to I feel like we passed it. She's like, no, 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 we didn't pass it. You know, keep going. I'm like, ah, oh, I think we passed it. I am so convinced that we passed it. And so I'm like, no, 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 we passed it though, right? We've driven for another like five minutes. I'm like, we passed it, Christy. We passed it. She's like, Dan, I have the map. We did not pass the exit. We're fine. But I am convinced now, like I am sure of it. I am positive that we have passed where we're supposed to exit. So I do the most foolish thing, I turn the car around, even though my wife has the map in front of her. And she's like, what are you doing? And I said, we, we passed it. I'm sure of it. You are totally way off. We passed the exit. She's like, Dad, we did not pass it. And the whole way back, like, we're just back and forth with one another as we're driving back to Edmonton, kind of thing. We're like, oh, no, you know, you don't know the map. Yeah, no, I know the map, and yada, yada, yada. It keeps on going. This is an intense moment of fellowship right now in the car. <laughs> Right, like it is feeling strenuous, it is feeling tense. But as we're heading back towards Edmonton, I start to realize, I don't think we passed it. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. But of course I can't say that out loud, right? Like I gotta be quiet about that. I don't wanna give her an edge, right? And so instead we get back to the city though, and I'm like, ah, oh, darn it. So I turn back around. And after about 30 minutes going on the highway, just like Christy said, there was the exit to Highway 37 up towards Grand Prairie. There it was. It was really quiet in the car. <laughs> really quiet for a while. Now we've moved from being angry to being bitter. Right now you're just in this next stage of conflict. We have progressed on. We weren't talking to each other just out of spite, I think, right? Just out of pure spite for one another. You know, it's funny how we are sometimes, right? Like when someone hurts us, we have this desire to hurt them back in some way, right? Want to, want to get even a little bit, want to take revenge. We can become bitter towards one another, can't we? In fact, did you know that sometimes when we lead to that kind of lifestyle where we are bitter with someone, it can lead us to do crazy things, so crazy that some people have gone so far as to build what is called a spite house. I don't know how many of you know what a spite house is. I didn't actually know what a spite house was until I looked it up online. This is a real thing. I'm going to show you a picture up here of a home in Boston, Massachusetts. Okay? So the home on the right is kind of like the house we're going to look at here. Here's the story behind what you're seeing right here. I didn't know this was real, but this is a real thing. Okay. 
Uh, so back in the 1800s, there were two brothers. They were given their inheritance and land from their father when he died. One of those brothers went off to fight in the Civil War. The other brother stayed behind, took most of the inheritance, most of the land, and built the house that you see on the right in that photo. Right? So they're kind of like nice, you're not going to brick house with all the windows going up. That's the brother's house who stayed behind from war. And he left barely any land and almost no inheritance for the other brother who was away at war. In fact, the house on the right had a gorgeous view. Every morning, the sun would come in through the windows on the one side of the house, and it was perfect. Like, it was just a gorgeous house that this brother was in love with. When the other brother, though, came home from war, feeling so hurt and angry, he built what is now known as a spite house. He built a spite house. He built what was left of the land and the money. He built a home flush beside the other house. You can see it there right beside it, blocking out the windows and the sunlight out of pure spite towards his brother. In fact, you'll notice on the one house there in the middle, there's no uh, front door there. The reason why is because he couldn't actually build a front door because of the way the house was built. So instead, there is a window on the other side that you have to climb in and out of to get out of that house. He lived there till the day he died. Out of spite towards somebody else. Isn't that the wildest thing? Like, I didn't think that was a true thing when I saw this photo. But isn't that wild? Isn't that crazy? I mean, who would do that sort of thing? Who would ever be that bitter, that angry, that they would go so far to make someone else's life that miserable? Who would do that to somebody? You know, we see a house like that and we think, that's absurd. I would never do something like that. I would never spend my time and my resources, my energy. I would never do that to somebody. But if you think about it, though, many of us here today have been so hurt and angry and bitter towards someone else that we've built houses just like that. But the catch is we can't see them. The difference is it's only us that can see them. No one else can. We've been so hurt by someone else, so angry that we've built Walls between us and them completely blocking out any chance for the relationship to be made whole. All the joy gone because of the house, because of the bricks that we've constructed around other people, because of what they've done to us. I know this is true because I have built one of these houses. Brick by brick, I did it myself. When I was 13 years old, I remember one day being in gym class. We were doing a unit on uh, gymnastics where you had to find a friend in class, you had to pair up, and you had to go to each of the stations, you had to track how you were doing, and you'd get marks based on how you were doing. My partner was not interested in tracking any of what we were doing. He was just out for a good time. I can't blame him. At the same time, like, I'm, like, stressed because I want the marks. Like, I want to be in this, you know, like, I want to be good at what I'm doing, all these things. And this really stressed me out. So I went to go tell my uh, gym teacher what was going on. But when I got to him, I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. See, I've had a stutter since I was about six years old. And at that moment, it was showing itself at the worst possible time. And I was frozen. Like, I couldn't say a word, trying as hard as I could. And after about seven seconds, which felt like seven minutes, of me not saying a word, struggling to speak, my teacher in front of about five other students began to mock me and mimic my stutter. And in anger, he said to me, I don't have time to wait for you to talk. And he stormed off. The look on everyone else's face in that little circle was pure shock. The look on my face was shame. I'd never felt so small, so insignificant, so worthless before. I went to the locker room and hid in the showers, crying until class was over. And when I got to my next class, I cried through the, whole, through the entirety of that class. Some of my friends who were there in the gym, they were there to see it happen. They were pleading with me to go to the principal and say something. In fact, they said that they would even do, do all that for me. They would go with me and they would say what happened. 
I was so embarrassed I didn't want to go. I just felt so small. I just wanted to forget that it ever happened. And outside the few people that were there, I never told a soul about that. Not even to my folks, not until years later when I finally told my parents it had happened. Instead of saying anything, I built a house. I began to lay bricks of anger, shame, hurt, and unforgiveness. And with each brick that I would lay, the wounding in my heart would grow. The wound would grow. The lies about who I am started to take over. And when I left school, when I left that school in grade nine, I promised myself that if I ever saw that man again, I would tell him off. That I would let him know what he did to me. That I would tell him straight up, this is how what you did wounded me. How he hurt me. For years, my heart was hard. I found it hard to trust lots and lots of authority figures, in particular men, for a long time. My house was built and there was no joy or sunlight to be found. I wonder, though, if I'm not the only one here today that has built a house. We've all been hurt. Someone has wronged you. They have done something to you that is awful. Your trust has been totally thrown out the window. Maybe it's what they said to you. Maybe for some of you, someone has hurt you so deeply that to forgive them seems impossible. Maybe you've even said to yourself, I will never forgive them for what they've done. Maybe you said those words. For others, maybe you've bought into the idea of our culture around us that says when someone does something to offend you, you can cancel them. You can be done with them. You can cut them out of your life. How many of us have been online with somebody and we've decided just to totally block them online? But as well, we do the same emotionally if they've done anything wrong to you, if they've caused an offense. Jesus knew that this area of hurt and unforgiveness had the potential to be one of our defining traits as people. It could define who we are, that in a world marked by sin, our sins against each other could lead to hard hearts and bitterness. And as we come to the word this morning, as we come to God's word, as we look at this story from Jesus, Jesus is going to do what he is very good at this morning. God is going to give us a picture of life with him fully surrendered in the kingdom. He's going to give us a picture of what it looks like to give these hurts and this heartache over to him. And he's also going to hold up a mirror. And we're going to be invited to deal with what's going on in our hearts. Jesus is going to invite you to wrestle with this passage, with this story. Because he loves you. So maybe, maybe for you, maybe Jesus has already started to stir some things in you. Maybe already there's maybe someone in mind that though you can already think of that you just know, man, I, I have a house built there. And so here's my hope for you today. Here's my prayer for you today. Can you just listen to the words of Jesus? Can you just sit at his feet? Like, don't, don't worry about my words. Worry about his words. Because he's kind. And he's loving and he's going to invite you in to what he has for you. So in Matthew 18, starting in verse 21, Jesus is in this midst of this extensive talk with his followers about what it means to be in a relationship with each other. It starts with one of them asking Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom? And as this whole conversation goes on, despite though Jesus laying out for them what greatness is, Peter has this desire to ask this question to, in some ways, kind of justify himself. I always feel that, though, for Peter, he gets a bad rap a lot of the time in Scripture. He's kind of known sometimes as, like, this guy that just says these, like, wild things that don't make sense. I actually don't think that's true of Peter. I actually don't think he actually comes across as this, you know, kind of wild man that he always gets, you know, kind of labeled as. Instead, I actually think he's just like you and me. I think he asks questions that we would ask a lot of the time. You know, in fact, to do for Peter, you've got to think about this guy. He is the, uh, I think, the oldest of the 12, but 
most importantly, he wants everyone, including those who are listening, and in particular, I'd say Jesus, to think that he's spiritually wise. He wants to be seen as that old guy who knows what he's doing, who knows what he's talking about. And so, just like Peter always does, he follows up with this question for Jesus that he thinks makes him look spiritually mature, makes him look spiritually wise. In verse 21, it says this, uh, then for Peter, he came and asked, Lord, how often should I uh, 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 forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Here's the thing about the question for Peter. To everyone hearing Peter, the offer to forgive someone seven times is actually way beyond the norm of that time. Way beyond the norm of the culture in those days. In fact, they believed, based on how they saw things in Scripture, that the maximum amount of times that you had to do that was three times. Peter goes more than double. He says, man, what about seven times, Jesus? Like, that's, that's being pretty generous, right? Like, that's being pretty loving, pretty merciful. Like, that's, that's a big thing. It seems like he's being really gracious with this number. But for Jesus, his answer goes way beyond what his listeners are expecting. It says in verse 22, no, not seven times, Peter, but... 70 times 7. You see, though, for the question that was asked by Peter, although sounding loving, generous, kind, gracious, all these things, he still has a cap on it. He still has a limit for how much he's going to extend. There's still an end date on that. Right? But after all, there's only so much you can extend. Right? I mean, we're not supposed to be a doormat, right, Jesus? Like, that's not how it works. We, we have our limit of grace, right? Because eventually, man, like, we, we don't want to be hurt again. Right? We have a limit, Jesus, on how much we can give, right? But instead of the two, the answer from Jesus is so big and so vast that really what he's saying to Peter is stop counting. Stop counting. Don't keep score. We live in a culture where we like to keep score. We have a limit on how much mercy we can give. In fact, this world is ruthless when it comes to second chances. We're harsh towards one another. We write people off because of what they say on Facebook. We decide we're done. How many people have we cut out of our lives because of something they said or did? I remember those of you growing up hearing the line that we're supposed to turn the other cheek but we only have so many cheeks, right? Now, in the moment, though, hear my heart, and I want you to hear the heart of Jesus for you. Some of you in this room have experienced things that I know are horrible, awful, and I am sorry for the things that you've had to endure from someone else. And I realize those things carry weight far beyond what you are able to carry. I recognize that, and so does Jesus. And the idea of moving past some of these things for some of you seems so far off. But again, I, don't, but again, I just want to encourage you, sit today with the words of Jesus. Let him lead your heart through these moments this morning. And now for Jesus, he's going to put this into story because this is the best way for us to understand, and he knows this. He likes story to help our hearts grasp what he's getting at. So verse 23, it says this. Therefore, the, uh, the, uh, therefore, the uh, kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of the other servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. And the fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And then when the fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, 
you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, he says, my father will do every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Just to be there in this moment, to be present as he is sharing this story would be jarring for a lot of people listening to hear his words firsthand from Jesus. Jesus says this king wants to settle this account and one of the servants owns, owes him 10,000 talents. If you did the math today, if you were to do this and say, okay, how much would that equal today? This isn't just simply um, low millions, which would still be lots for anybody to ever pay back. This would be the equivalent of about $2.5 billion. $2.5 billion. Even if you live another 100 years, you will never pay that back. $2.5 billion. Could you imagine owing that much. And back then, if you couldn't pay back your debt, it was normal practice for the master to sell the servant, the family, and anything else that might earn back money towards the debt. That was normal practice. But remember, 2.5 billion. 2.5 billion. All those things combined could never pay that back. There is nothing that can be done from this man to make this debt go away. There is nothing he owns that could ever make this debt right. Nothing. This servant is going to jail. It is clear for the listeners. This is where the story is going. He will never pay it back. But the servant falls on his knees begging the king, please have patience with me and I'll pay it all back. But he won't though, right? We know he won't because, the, because it is way too much. He will never pay it back. Even as he says that, he knows internally, I will never pay back the debts. It's too big for me. But the king looks on the servant with pity and forgives his debt. He says, you don't owe me a thing. You don't owe me a thing. You can leave. Now, you would think that this servant's life would somehow be forever changed by this moment, right? In fact, just imagine for some of us in this moment, if that was us, that would change who you are. That would change how you were the whole two with other people. That would change your life if someone said to you, you don't owe $2.5 billion. It's all gone. It's forgiven. That would change who you are wouldn't it? And you would think that this servant, after this incredible debt being wiped out, that he would live differently, but what does he do? It says again in verse 28, when that same servant went out, he found another fellow servant who owed him a hundred denarii. Seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debts. He finds another servant who owes the money. This is the equivalent of $4,000. $2.5 He's in the same position as the king. The same position. But instead he finds him, puts his hands on him, chokes the guy out, and says, there is no second chances with me. Pay what you owe. And he has him thrown in jail. And when the king hears what happened, he says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, because you asked me to. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Should you not have acted the way that I acted with you? So the king throws the servant in jail and says, my father will do the same to everyone who does not forgive from their heart. This passage is hard. Walking this out is not easy. As Jesus invites us to look in the window of what it's like to serve him and to honor him with our lives, we get this beautiful picture to forgive one another, to wipe out massive debt. We feel the weight of the debt come off the servant. We see the heart of the king to forgive this incredible debt. And I don't know about you, but my heart is moved and stirred towards Christ when I think about this passage, when I think about the debt that he's wiped away. 
And I want to live like that, to forgive others freely the way that he forgives others freely. But where we get hung up is when we have to look in the mirror at this passage. Because the story not only brings up where we failed, but it also brings up the hurt that we've experienced. It brings the hurt that we've experienced. A big reason why this is so hard to do, why it's so hard to live out, is because the hurt that we have experienced is real. It's real pain that we've gone through. Right? It's not just up in the sky. It's not just a great idea. It's not just whatever. This is real things that we've gone through in our lives. We have been hurt by other people. It's hard for that just to vanish, just to wipe away. And so we don't want to be hurt again. And we won't allow ourselves to be used by somebody else. And so we continue to build our house. And we put up bricks. Our eyes become fixed on the debt that someone owes to us and the pain they've caused us. And to let that go to forgive them feels impossible. And we miss out on the grace and mercy being extended towards us. You know, there's a quote from uh, Michael Wilkins and he kind of has this, the like framing of how he sees this parable. Mercy experienced will produce mercy demonstrated. Mercy experienced will produce mercy demonstrated. I often wonder what would have happened if the servant had let mercy that was extended to him sink in in a real way. How might his life have been different? About 12 years ago, Christy and I were living in Vanderhoof, B.C. And we came home though, over the summer for, uh, I think, the holidays to see my parents. And for Christy, she was about two or three months pregnant at the time. And um, she had cravings that were all over the map, let me tell you. Like, she wanted the wildest foods. And it didn't matter what time of the day, like, we were going to stop for her because that's how it worked. And so when we were here in Edmonton, (laughs) we would leave, you know, about 8.30 in the morning. It's about a 10-hour drive back to Vanderhoof, so it's this long haul. But on the way out, she says to me, she's like, man, I got this craving today. I'm like, okay, what do you want? She's like, I need a, I need a milkshake from A&W. It has to be root beer. I was like, man, babe, it's not even 9 in the morning. Like, no one's going to have milkshakes available at this time. It doesn't make sense. But you do what you got to do, am I right? So on our way out of town, we find an A&W. And I, you know, walking in there, I'm like, there's no way they're going to have milkshakes on at this time of the day. Like, it's, it's, it's not happening. And so I go to the counter. And I'm like, I need a large root beer milkshake. I feel weird ordering it. Kind of the girl's like, oh, yeah, no problem. Oh, okay, gross. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. And so as I'm waiting for the milkshake, though, I notice out of the corner of my eye a man coming to the counter to refill his coffee. And after doing a double take, I realize it's my teacher from gym class. In that moment, I felt the breath in my lungs leave. I began to panic. I couldn't breathe. All I wanted to do was to go over to him and tell him off, just like I had planned for years. This, just this moment of rage in me. I was just ready But I was frozen, just like before. I couldn't move. I found myself stuck to the floor. I couldn't get out of that moment. All the anger, the hurt, the shame, his words on a loudspeaker, now in my head louder than ever. And so with tears welling up, I grabbed the milkshake and I ran out of there as fast as I could. I don't even really think when I got in the car, I don't think my wife noticed how emotional I was. But for the entirety of the 10-hour drive home, he is all I thought about and the missed opportunity I had to tell him how I really felt about him. My heart was so bitter. I was so angry. I had built an enormous house. Enormous. And then I fast forward nine years later. I still haven't dealt with any of this hurt yet. After nine years from that moment, they're in A&W. I didn't realize I was the walking wounded. I found myself at a soul care conference hosted 
by uh, some here in our district. And so the idea behind these is, is to unpack the emotional baggage that you carry in your life and just to simply bring it to Jesus and let him heal those things for you. And on the Saturday afternoon of that conference, we were invited to go back to a time in our lives where we experienced wounding from someone else. To invite Jesus into that moment and ask Jesus where he was when that happened. And when I thought about what moment to invite Jesus into, right away he knew the moment to bring me to. He brought me back to that gym. Back to that moment with my teacher. And all the emotion came flooding back and I clenched my fist as I sat on the ground. I could feel the air in my lungs leaving again. It was like I was reliving the moment. And imagine myself telling this teacher how I really felt. In my head, like I am yelling at him. I am telling him what he did wounded me deeply and how his words have left a lasting impact on my life. Like I am giving him what for in my mind. And at the height of the emotion that I was feeling, when I couldn't get any angrier, Jesus in his kindness showed up in that memory for me. And he gave me this picture of him standing behind me, holding me and crying with me as I stood there. I felt so protected and safe in his arms, overwhelmed by his presence. I felt a peace like never before, like this weight was coming off. And in the next moment, I saw Jesus walk behind the teacher and he places his hands on his shoulders. And I heard Jesus say to me, Dan, you need to forgive him for what he did. And I remember feeling so disoriented. And in an honest way back to Jesus, I just said, why should I do that? Why should I do that? And for Jesus, he said, because I've forgiven you. Because I've forgiven you. And I understood mercy experience will produce mercy demonstrated. When you experience it yourself, it will be demonstrated as an outworking of what Jesus has done. The reality of what Jesus has done for me began to sink in like never before. And I thought about all my sin, my shame, my guilt, the things that I've done in my life. And I saw this huge debt that I owed. All the things that I'd done wrong to other people just came to mind. Jesus brought to mind passages though from the Bible. All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. In that moment with Jesus, the weight of what I have done felt heavy. And my sin against God required that debt be paid in some way. I pictured myself standing in a courtroom and all the things that I've done wrong laid bare and a judge looking at all of it and saying, someone has to pay for that. And in the middle of the courtroom, I look to Jesus and he stands up and says, I'm going to pay that. That's on me. He took the penalty for my sin and he put it on himself. He wiped my debt clean. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He paid what I owed with his life. And now I am a new creation in Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come. I am his, he has restored me, he's given me a name, he's clothed me with righteousness. This is what Jesus has done. And as the reality of what he did sunk in, the house that I had built for so many years began to come down. Brick by brick, I felt it fall away. I was free to forgive because I had been forgiven. It landed on me. And the journey to that wound being healed could finally start. In fact, the next day I felt this, it was almost a prompting from Jesus to go and find that man again, to find that guy I met in the gym, that teacher who said those horrible things, and to forgive him. I had this prompting from Jesus to find him. And after doing a lot of the time on the internet to dig to find out who he was, where he lives, I learned that he had passed away about seven years prior. At first, I felt like I missed an opportunity to extend forgiveness. 
But here's what I came to learn. As I continue to walk towards healing and wholeness, it's a new opportunity to extend forgiveness every day to him. Every day to do it again and again and again. Some days that wound for me feels really fresh still. It feels really fresh. And those same feelings of shame and bitterness try to resurface. And if I fix my eyes on the hurt, I know what I will do. I will start to build the house all over again. I will start to put the bricks up. But the invitation from Jesus is to focus my eyes on him and what he has done. And in my heart, I hear Jesus asking me to extend forgiveness again, just to keep going, because Jesus says, I stopped counting. I don't count, and I don't want you to count either. Just keep doing it. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what kind of weight this morning you're carrying. I don't know the hurt that you've experienced, but I do know that we've all experienced hurt. Perhaps you felt hurt by someone in this room, even. Someone that you maybe love and trust. Someone maybe said something, in fact, though, too, maybe someone said something to you years ago and the words are just now on repeat in your head. Maybe today you feel like the walking wounded. Can I ask you just to do something this morning? Just to look to Jesus. Just to linger with him this morning for a little bit. He loves you. He cherishes you. And in him, through the work on the cross, Jesus died for you. He, he paid your debt for your sins. He has wiped your debt clean. You owe him nothing. And Jesus is inviting you today to start to tear your house down. You know, I've been asked, though, like over the last probably two or three years, why I like to share so much of my story. And it's because I firmly believe that Jesus wants to do it again. I think he wants to heal hearts. I think he wants to redeem people. I think he wants to move in powerful ways. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I want to give you space to linger with Jesus. Just to be with him in his presence. Just to soak it in. And to allow him to lead your heart where he wants it to go. He is kind and he is gentle. And I promise you, he will be kind and gentle to you in these next few moments. He doesn't have any other way. It's who he is. So as we close here, let's just pray together. I'm just going to kind of lead you through some things and then just give you some space. So let's, let's pray together. Just maybe for some of you here this morning, maybe some of you though, are in a place where this has stirred some things for you where your heart is feeling pretty raw. And in this moment, I just want to invite you just to recognize that Jesus is with you right now. He is in the room. He is present. And he sees you. And he knows your hurts and your pain and your grief. Jesus is with us, his church, in this moment. And so for some of you here this morning, maybe some of you just need to soak in who he is in his presence. Maybe some of you just need to come back to a place in which you are thankful for what Jesus has done for you, that the weight of your sin has been lifted from you and you just need to celebrate what Jesus has done for you and then to live out of that posture. Maybe for others, maybe, maybe Jesus is inviting you to go back to a memory in which you need to know where he was in the moment. And I know for some of you, that might seem terrifying. And if that's you today, if you're like, I don't think I can go that far yet, that's okay. That's okay. You don't have to. But rather, what I want to encourage you to do, though, is to come have a chat with myself or another one of us on staff here. Maybe find yourself at the hub where you can start to work through your grief and your hurt and your heartache. Right? Like, man, that is a great place to deal with some of the things in our lives. And so, but just don't let this be the, the last opportunity that you take today, right? And make sure you take another step. 
And so I'm just going to pray for you now. Jesus, would you move however it is that you want to move today? Jesus, we confess that we are lost without you. You are king. And you saw our pain, our hurt, our sin, and you wiped our debt clean with your very blood. You died for our sins. And three days later, you rose from the grave so that we might live the life that you intended us to live, a life fully devoted to you, sold out for you, Jesus. And in this moment, Jesus, we want to linger with you in that reality. So Jesus, would you move now to you by your Holy Spirit? And we love you. We just ask these things in your name. Amen.